Mark Carmen is VIB TV. We're here today with Robert McConnell. Robert is a Vallejo lawyer and uh, he is running for Vallejo City Council. So uh, Robert, we've uh, sat down a number of times over the course of uh, Vallejo's bankruptcy and discussed some of the issues, legal issues and, and so on. So you and I are no strangers. Uh, and now you're, uh, you're running for City Council. So um, first of all, why don't you tell me why you're running for City Council? Well, I saw what I perceived as a need for a different type of thinking in the city, one that will shift from the past, where it starts to become more involved with the things that need to be done to make our government better, and of course to be able to attract business to the city that hasn't been done before, to get away from the old boys, if you will, network, the same way of thinking. I think we need to go into the next realm of advancement. And I don't see that happening with whom we've had on the council as the majorities in the past. And unless we get the right majority on the council this time, I don't see it happening again. So I felt that there was a strong need. The Probably the one issue that decided, uh, motivated me to run more than anything else was when during the repayment structuring of the bankruptcy when we are trying to determine how we are going to adjust our debts. Mm -hmm. Our city council voted a 6.29 percent increase for our police officers for one year which has already kicked in plus another increase up to 6.29 percent that started on July 1st of this year in an amount yet to be determined pursuant to a wage survey. And of course, I've taken hundreds, if not thousands, of businesses and individuals through repayment bankruptcies, and I lecture, I preach, I harp about how you control your expenses, how you don't start spending more money just because life seems like it's getting a little better. You've got to stay the course, and I saw that as a real failure on the part of our leadership. I saw that it didn't have any vision, that it didn't have comprehension of the difficulty of the problem that we're truly facing and actually will continue to face until our economy really does turn around, which is not going to happen, I believe, for at least three to five years. So we have uh, uh, we've got some critical times coming up uh, that the new council is going to decide on, one being the uh, contracts of 2012. Yes, very much so, and who the voters select this year is very much the major consideration of what they will do with a city manager because those seven people, whomever they are, are the ones who will make that decision to hire the city manager and we need to have a city manager that this time is going to be here for 10, 15, 20 years. We certainly have gone through a lot of them in the past few years, that's for sure. Too many and for too many bad reasons. Uh, that type of thinking also needs to change. So I see the need for a real change in mindset on our city council and even by those of us who live here in town. And I felt I could bring that change to the council and that it was time to either put up or shut up. So I <laughs> decided to, to put my hat in the ring, so put to speak. Put your name up there and, and, and go for it. See what happens. Right. You never know. <laughs> so so what? How, tell me a little bit about how you came to Vallejo. Give me a little bit of your background. Well, I'm a multi-generation Californian, and a, one of my great great-grandfathers actually helped write the California Constitution of 1850 that helped to keep this state free at that time. Um, I've grown up in the public education system. My parents and family are graduates of UC. I believe in public education very, very strongly. I attended San Jose State, also Sierra College. I got my bachelor's degree in public administration. Then I started working in the graduate work in public administration as well. I had finished all my master's thesis, all my master's courses when the Army decided they needed me more. And so I had had my topic approved to write my master's thesis when it became time to go to war. So oddly enough, that thesis... That was, uh, you, went, you went to Vietnam. I was a combat rifleman in Vietnam. I'm the guy with the M16 that slapped through the rice paddies of the Mekong Delta. Yes, I, I did it all. And I did what infantry people do. And of course that was a substantial impact upon how I looked at things. Uh, before I was ready to go to work in government uh, in some phase and after that I kind of was soured on the whole process I have to admit. And it did take me 
many years to get past that point. Uh, it's been a long healing process. But I think that given my background, given my education, given my experiences, given my temperament, I can bring something to the city council that hasn't been there for a long time, and that's insight, that's understanding about how a city manager system really does work. It's the skills of the legal training as well as the budgetary training because public administration is the business end of government. And we, we study things like budgeting, personnel, staffing, all those nice technical boring things that really make the, the wheels of government work. And I think that when you have a better understanding of that, it brings something to the city council level that has not been there in the past. Right. So, that's so, so you understand the, the, the mechanics of government, the bureaucracy, and you're, you're, you have some experience navigating that. It's the business, the politics as well. Mm -hmm. While I was in law school, I was on the law review, and I had to cover Willie Brown, who was the chair of the Ways and Means Committee in the Assembly. Uh, I dealt with the lobbyists. I worked at the state personnel board where I had to get money out of Governor Reagan's super cabinet at the time when none did, existed in order to recruit people into the state government. Uh, I did budgets while I was a government intern at the personnel board before I became the, the head of the organization. I did nothing but run wages standards and compensation standard surveys so the state could pay prevailing wages. So all day long we found out what highway patrolmen were paid compared to police officers in Fresno, compared to, sher compared to sheriff well, officers in Shasta County. Now you're going to be you're going to be <laughs> facing uh, potentially that issue in in in, in 2012 uh, with employee contracts coming up. What do you think needs to be done uh, to 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 keep Vallejo from basically going over the edge again? in that regard at least. A lot. Um, okay. We're not going to be potentially facing it. We're going to have to take it on full force. They can't kick the uh, can down the road for another two years as they did in the past. And whom the voters select as the city council members are the ones who are going to make that decision. So the voters this time are casting the die as to who will negotiate those contracts, what's going to go into them, and also who the city manager is going to be. What needs to be done is we have to be more financially prudent than we have ever, ever been before in our past. And that means understanding where our tax money comes from, what it's spent on, what the general fund is compared to the water fund, compared to the reserve funds. I mean, we have over a hundred bank accounts, if you will, checking accounts in our municipal government. And it's only the one checking account, the general fund, that went into Chapter 9. That's what people, I think, are not fully aware of. Which is essentially in, in the bit that the council has real discretionary influence over to a That's it. great extent. But to the extent they tie up obligations to spend that discretionary money for employee salaries, for potholes, for arts centers, then you're tying your hands in the hands of future councils as to what you do. And one thing you don't do is give five and ten year contracts to employees. You don't do that in private business. I don't do that in my business. And you can't do it in government. That has to stop. That has to change also. We are going to have to be honest enough to sit down with our employees. They have a major stake in this game as do the taxpayers and the people who work at City Hall and the people who will sit on that dais. And that means honest, open, non-personal dialogue. Um, one of the real shortcomings in the Chapter 9 was this personal antagonism that arose. Right. And that has to be avoided, I think, at all costs. One of the things that being an attorney for 40 years have taught me is to listen very carefully and also to analyze the issues and the arguments, to not get into the idea of who says it and why they say it and where they're coming from or what. Somebody in Washington once said, you know, the best thing I ever learned as a politician in this town was never attack their motivation, only their judgment. Right. So, so we need some, some, some cultural change uh, or some cultural progress in terms of the relations in city government. But ultimately, it's about the money, and a lot of people are, are focusing on Measure B, yes, indeed. which is going to increase the sales tax by 1%. It's going to give us, they estimate, somewhere around nine and a half, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, million dollars uh, per, year. Uh, per year, which is a pretty sizable pile of money. Good chunk. Yeah. 
So where do you stand on, on Measure B and also in terms of where to spend, what money we have, how to spend it, and, and, and so on? Well, first off, I'm voting no on Measure B. Okay. And I'm doing that because I don't think this government has addressed the necessary structural changes on how they operate as a business entity. If you put $9.8 million onto the table every year, then obviously a lot of people are going to come forward and make demands upon that $9.8 million, especially employees. We already pay high, high compensation standards, and that doesn't mean just yes. wages. It also takes into pension plans, contributions for union off time, you name it. That's, it's a wide specter of what goes into gets, how it gets paid. And if we throw $9.8 million on the table, I don't think we'll ever address the need to reshape how we conduct business in, at the government level. So I'm against it as that. I'm also against it because I believe that we are slipping more and more into poverty in this nation. We have gone from 15.2% from up to 15.9% poverty level. That was in 2010. It's going up. Uh, in, 19, in 1980, our sales tax in this state was 4%, and I can remember when it was 3%. So we've gone from 3% to 65 now, and we're pushing it higher and higher, and all we do is put it on the, on, on the backs of the middle class. We've got to get government off the backs of the middle class, and we have to take that mentality away that is made so, nothing more than a golden goose. So in other words, you're, you, in essence, what you're saying is that the, the bad decisions are going to be paid for on the backs of the taxpayers. They will continue to be paid on the backs of taxpayers. Even if we stop contributing a, a red cent to anybody for future retirement plans right this minute, and we wanted to come clean and settle up our debts, you and I would each have to write a check for $1,750 for every individual in this city to pay that debt that we already have to pay. And when we keep continuing to pay for it... You're, you're talking about the unfunded... Uh, liabilities and obligation for retirees, yes, which goes, in, which goes into compensation standards as well. It's not just wages, and that's what we need to think yeah. about. Also, I, I, if we really had the guts, we would put onto the ballot a tax measure that said, vote for what you want to spend your money on. Participatory budgeting is what we call it in mm -hmm. government. And that's where you say, okay, I want a quarter percent to go to police, I want a quarter percent to go to fire, I want a quarter percent to go to road repair, I want a quarter percent to go to education, I want a quarter percent to go to entertainment, you name it. But of course we don't do that. What we have instead is a council that says, well, we're afraid we can't get the 75 percent vote, so uh, we're going for it's the 50 special, level. It's a special tax. That's a special tax. Now, it, it just seems weird to me, I don't know what your thought is, but it, it seems like a general, a general tax it requires just a simple majority, right? Correct. And a special tax is, is what is it, two thirds or 75%? It's two, two thirds. Two thirds, mm -hmm. okay. So that requires two thirds, mm -hmm. as a special tax being where you designate how the money is spent. It, it, it seems mm -hmm. to me like it doesn't make sense. It should be the other way around. I agree with you on mm -hmm. that, but that's what the state law is. Mm -hmm. And if this pass, this does pass, then the real challenge for a council is to decide what to do with it. And everybody's saying, oh, I'm going to fund police, I'm going to fund fire, I'm going to do better parks, you name it. Well, I think what we have to do is go a little bit further and get some citizen involvement, show some leadership here, put together a citizen's advisory committee so we don't get the special interest lobbying the individual members that they've helped uh, elect to the council. Instead, we get the community involved. And this is one of the things that we advocated on the Charter Review Committee. I was on the Finance Subcommittee for that one. And other cities do it. They have what's called participatory budgeting. It's where they actually go out into the community before the budget cycle gets into its final stages and they survey them. How much do you want to spend on police? If you have $100, how much do you want to give to a policeman? How much do you want to give to a fireman? How much do you want to give to the parks? What are you going to do with your money? I don't think some employee groups would like that very much. Well, they may not, but the reality is, is we are a democracy, and just like in combat, not everybody works on the government front line. Most of them work in private industry, as I do, as you do, and we're the ones who have to, really have to pay the bills. And I think that mentality needs to change a little bit more. We've swung so far away from where we were as a country originally, 
to now we elect a legislative body and we say see you later in four years in the meantime do the job and we'll check in on you four years later and see how you've done and how we think you've done and what kind of rhetoric you're going to have certain, for the next a certain four level years. of apathy basically or, or exhaustion maybe on the part of the voters and well, the electorate and we've we've done that more in the last 20 years than we've ever done before uh, and that's not really the way our country was set up or designed it was designed on the idea that we would have legislators who would come back to their district and associate with their people that the people would be studying these issues they would be an educated populace and they would tell these legislators what they thought and we've gotten away from that and I think we have to actually get back to it more than we've ever done before, which means having neighborhood associations where you have somebody like Vallejo Heights, uh, the old downtown association that's become defunct, uh, Glen Cove, Hiddenbrook Neighborhood Association. These aren't homeowner associations. These are neighborhood associations. They can't tell you what color blinds to have. And they get together and they study the issues as they come up before the government entity, and they are advised of them. That's the difference. We have neighborhood associations to get notices from the planning division in Chapter 16 of our municipal code, the zoning requirements. And when something's going to come up in their neighborhood, they get a notice of it if there's a neighborhood association. If not, they get the 200-foot notice, notice only. That notice can come out 72 hours. Those, that's over the weekend. You can put a notice on the bulletin board at Friday, uh, Friday at 5 o'clock and have it heard Sunday or Monday night at, at 7 o'clock and you've complied with all that the law requires of you. That's got to change. We need to shift it back doesn't, so that people yeah, can find doesn't out about it. doesn't give people stuff. enough time to, to react and to give input. No, it doesn't, but it also requires them to be organized enough to get notice, to study the issues, to have an opinion, and to effectively put their opinions before a legislative body so that they don't come down on Monday night or when the, when the council meets and say, oh, we've got 15 minutes to present our, our positions, and you get three minutes as a speaker, and then all of a sudden you know, there's a vote. Do you, do, you you think like it's a, it, do you think it's approachable for you as a, as a council member to, to bring about substantial change in that area? I do, and I think it has to be done. Uh, it, it, it can be as minutia as moving the speaker's podium. I sat on that dais for eight years on the planning commission. I sat on it on the charter review committee. And if you're in the far chair, all the one to the left of the room, that's a long distance over to that speaker's podium. And, I, and I've been in other jurisdictions where that speaker's podium is right in front of the dais. They're down where the staff tables are now, and they've got a podium there. And when they're speaking, those legislators have got to look these people on the right in the eye. And the other thing that does is that it opens up the potentiality for dialogue. And of course, most of our councils are, are just adverse to dialogue. They just want to hear what you say and next. And I think that really detracts from the government process. I think we've got to get people more involved. We have to structure the way in which they can get involved. Obviously, you can't have council meetings that go from 7 until midnight forever. That's oh, just going to burn to everybody out. Yes, you have. And that's not fair to people who have something at the end of the agenda. One of the things I'd like to do is a spin-off on the uh, British House of Commons, where they have the Prime Minister, the head of the entire government, come in, and they get hammered with questions from other pe people in the House. What we can do in Vallejo is we can have maybe one session a month, or one session every two or three months, where all like the Like a town hall meeting kind of thing, but... More a, than that. More of a no-holes-barred town hall no meeting. No-holes-barred, and where you've got, <laughs> your, you've got your department heads mm. there, your city manager there, the city attorney there, and anybody can come in and say, can, what about this, what about that, and they can actually get an answer, because under the Brown Act, state legislation, which I think needs to be addressed also, you're so limited on what you can bring up. I mean, I was constantly being told by the city attorney of planning commission, that you can't go into that, it's beyond the scope of the Brown Act, it goes beyond our noticing requirement, that's illegal, you can't do it, and if you violate it, you're going to create a misdemeanor and you're going to be taken off council or off commission. You know, that's, that's one of the penalties for violating the Brown Act. Well, that Brown Act needs to be revisited. It was in originally intended to make sure the public business was done in the open. That's a good purpose. But it's become restrictive now. And how many times have you heard somebody at council or any other commission say, that's beyond the scope of our notice requirements, it violates the Brown Act, you can't talk about it. Pretty you know, frequently. Frustrating. Sure. So once every two or three months, let's have a no-holds-barred session where you can come down and ask anything about you, you want to and it doesn't have to be on the Brown Act. Now maybe the council and the commissions can't make a decision that night, that part's true, but they can at least talk about it. Right. And that needs to 
right. be something that so, will go a long ways towards modernizing and getting our citizenry involved again with the government. And so that's more, more openness, more participation in government, um, more fiscal responsibility. Absolutely. Um, wh what about some of the other s things that need to happen? Obviously, economic development is a big uh, mm -hmm. consideration. Vallejo, what's your what's your vision for improving that part of the equation? Okay. You got to crawl before you can walk. You, you got to walk before you can run. And right now, nobody wants to come to Vallejo for the most part. So what we're going to have to do is start real small, like festivals. We bring in a lot of money with some of our festivals, the Pirate Festival, the Bird Watchers uh, in January. Bird Watchers spend more money on their sport than any sport in the entire country. No kidding. Yeah, I know. It was a surprising uh, statistic that I, I came across. Yeah, I would have thought maybe <laughs> skiing or something was no, expensive. No, Bird Watchers, amazing. Bird isn't watchers. It? I know. <laughs> And then you, you reach out to small, small businesses. I mean really small, like less than 10. During a recession is when three out of five businesses are begun. And currently, at least, 60% of new businesses are being started by women. That means you have to make the process friendly to the people who want to start a business. Idea, we charge a business tax. I pay one for my, my license every year. Uh, the first year in business, ten dollars and what's more because everybody's so unhappy about our permitting process if you don't get an answer within 10 or 30 days we'll give you the ten dollars back that'll get some new businesses going um, we can have something called a business incubator some this is something the city of Concord does they're going towards the entrepreneurial incubator what we can do is we have a very uh, a dedicated building we team up with Sonoma State with Cal Maritime Academy with Turo we teach people how to run a business because people come to me when they're in trouble and they don't know anything about budgeting, they don't know anything about publicity, they don't know anything about personnel restrictions and most of them start businesses because they have this idea. They're not trained. So we team them up in a building where there are people who can provide that education while they're operating a retail business. It's limited to retail because retail pays sales taxes. And for two or three years while they're going through this learning process they get a reduced rent and at the end of the two to three years when they've completed the educational process and they find out whether or not they really want to stay in business, then they go out and they occupy our businesses in downtown Vallejo and our malls and they keep businesses here because the desirability of a business as compared to enhanced property values is you get the sales tax, you have property that pays property taxes of which we get 17 cents on the dollar only to begin with, you have employees who will also be earning money. You get people who start creating ideas, and it grows. Every business starts small, and this is our opportunity to appeal to real, real small businesses. National businesses will come to Vallejo and leave Vallejo if our demographics don't match. And there are a lot of ideas about what to use Mare Island for, what to use the downtown for. Right. Well, Mare Island, where we are now, is, is certainly mm -hmm. uh, a place that's looked to as um, in, a potential engine of, of industry, perhaps, but uh, development, revenue, mm -hmm. uh, and opportunity. So, what are what are your thoughts about about Mare Island? What can what what can that look like in the future? Some people are talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. about a casino, right, as an idea. Well. First off, Mare Island is a, an area that's split up into three different zones in our planning. And I've sat through and handled all those environmental impact reports and specific plans and everything else. And you know, I've read them. Um, you've got the north end, the south end, and the middle end that we're in right now. A lot of people do have advocated for an Indian casino on Mare Island. The problem with an Indian casino is that you cede all control to the Indian casino because they are complete nations. They, don't, they have autonomy, and that means we can't police them. We can't regulate them. <clears throat> they don't even have to pay sales tax. It does bring employment. Yes, it does. And I'm not adverse to a casino per se, because I, I worked in one one summer. I worked for Harris up at Lake Tahoe right before I left for Vietnam. <clears throat> and in the right location, I think uh, a casino is not necessarily a, a dead-on-arrival idea. But if it's hooked up with an Indian casino, then your only strength is to gain concessions in written form before you sign on the bottom line. So once you've signed on the bottom line, that's it, folks. You don't what, get to change what, what it later kind on. Of, what kind of concessions would you, would you 
Uh, well, for instance, well, a lot of people are against casinos because of the gambling addiction, and it certainly is a valid addiction. So uh, a condition is they have to fund and operate gambling anonymous classes. And they don't necessarily, they don't do that at the casino. Um, I, I've been involved with churches where we had Alcoholics Anonymous in our basements. And right. of course, there's a lot of money in that sometimes. So you a, can a lot of money in Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, there uh, can be. Really? Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. be, I, be, be, because they get they can have houses that are non profit that are paid for by contributions. The mm -hmm. people who are going through these counseling sometimes live in them and their social security checks because they're on disability are paid over and they build up houses. There's a lot of way to make money off the non profit world as well. But if you're going to have a gambling uh, facility here, you're going to have addicted people. So there's no avoiding it. Right. And that means you have to have gamblers and novices classes. You have to have counseling for them. You have to have regulations on lighting. You have to have crime suppression techniques already in place before you sign on that bottom line. Right. You don't get to realize later on, oh, we should have asked for this at the time and then go back and get it again because it's too late by then. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with the idea of if it's implemented casino. properly. Yeah, and that's that's where the devil is in the details, as they say. Anybody can say, oh, I want a, uh, a gambling casino down here. I want green technology down here. The idea is to carry it out. I mean, one of the things I think the North End should be looked at is the idea of factory uh, shopping, uh, like we have up in Vacaville, because currently a recent economic study indicated that more and more Americans are buying at the outlet malls. That's where they prefer to shop nowadays. Mm -hmm. There, the north. You don't end, think it's oversaturated with the stuff in in Napa, just nearby? Well, there are a lot of new businesses coming online, and if you notice, uh, the nearby factory malls tend to be the same ones. We have the advantage of being very close to Marin County. We also have the advantage of being on Interstate 80, so it, it's a natural justification for people coming together and people travel to shop. Let's face it. Uh, you and I might not be shoppers, but a lot of people are. And the other thing, of course, is I am against Measure B. Uh, I think that before we implement Measure B, we need to restructure our government. And if they implement Measure B, it's going to hit most heavily on the backs of the middle class and the lower middle class. Our sales tax was 4% in 1980. It was three and a half before that, and three percent when I was a child. Now we're up to six and seven and nine percent in different jurisdictions. And even though groceries per se aren't taxed, certain things that are sold within a grocery store are taxed. So you can't say <clears throat> we're just going to uh, hit it on our car dealers. Now, if you want to buy a car, so here, you so you see it. Uh, you, in other words, you're pointing out the the regressive uh, nature, very of nature the, of the, the sales tax. Yes, and we have more and more people slipping into poverty. Our median income is much lower here in Vallejo than any other part of, of this county. And we have a lot of people that are struggling in this city. Now, if you're making sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year and you're living in Hiddenbrook or one of the nice areas of Glen Cove, maybe that's not going to impact you that much. Yeah, it's not. But for somebody who is struggling on two thousand dollars a month or less, that's gonna start adding up. And when you talk, talk about clothing, you have to pay for it for that. You have to pay for it on, on repairs for parts on your car. It's, it multiplies throughout the system. And rather than just throwing it on the table where everybody can have a shot at it, what they want, I say let's be honest enough to make it dedicated to a specific purpose and really ask our taxpayers whether they want to buy into that idea. Let's get some leadership here. If it does pass, uh, Major B passes, then let's get a citizen advisory committee. Uh, there are already specific plans that are in place for Mare Island, the downtown. Right. But but if you got a, of course it's a general mm -hmm. uh, tax. If you got a citizens advisory committee, it would only be because the the council deemed to listen to the citizens, not because there was any uh, uh, way of converting it into a special tax. So it would still be a general tax. So it, it would just be, as you say, advisory. Well, yes, but then the, the council has to step forward and say, this is what I'm going to use it for. And right. you can't really, in all honesty, honesty, do that before this election because some taxpayer organizations will sue to declare the election illegal if that happens. So it's a tight, tight rope. Um, the real challenge is to know what to do if it doesn't pass. And for people who are in favor of it, that's fine. The question, next question is, what's going to happen if it doesn't pass? What are you going right. to do then? Right. And that's well, where it, we're it, talking about it. It really does seem, um, I mean, there's a, there, you hear some people talking about 
Vallejo has a balanced budget for the next five years. And he, he tell me if you think I'm right or not, but it, it seems to me that's predicated on, A, the economy not getting worse, and B, the sales tax passing. And C, property values not continuing to decrease. We've lost almost 70% of our property values in the city of Vallejo, and I track this every day for people coming into my office. I, I see it. You also have to believe that there are going to continue to have the sales level of businesses conducting retail sales at the same level we've had. When we say we have a ba balanced budget, it's predicated upon our receiving the same amount of money every year that we have at the moment. And our readjustment of debts is backloaded. We really have to pay out most of those debts in the last 18 months of our, our economy. And remember, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, a few months ago said, we're going to cut our programs. We're going to take out, what was it, $131 billion or whatever astronomical figure they said. That doesn't happen until October of 2014. That's when that money starts getting taken out of the federal government. The state budget is predicated upon 40% of its money being received from the federal government. So, come 2015, when the state budget gets cut, what will they do? They will turn around and they will cut it further from the cities and the counties. And where are we going to have the money then? So we have to think further down the road. We have to live very judiciously on our expenditures for, I think, at least five years, probably longer, because I don't see this economy coming back. Even the best estimates of unemployment is that it will go down by 1% by 2013. So, so maybe so we'll recover road, in There's a rocky road ahead. That's what everybody do, says. Do you, do, you think, uh, do you think Vallejo can stay solvent? Do you think we can keep from going into uh, uh, insolvency or, or yes, I, I hope do. not, bankruptcy again? I think we can. And Lord knows we don't want to double dip. I would not want to be that lawyer in front of Judge McManus again. No, no way. <laughs> um, but that means we have to control costs. And I've seen this and the people and the businesses I take through repayment forms of bankruptcies. We get the plan approved, and it feels, feels good now because things are working right. And then they start growing a little, little more comfortable, and they start becoming a little more lax. They buy a, a $200 pair of tennis shoes instead of a $65 pair of tennis shoes. And it's the same idea with organizations. They start bringing back additional expenditures and in reality a we, little bit each time we probably should be shopping at the dollar store whenever possible well we have to be judiciously shopping at the dollar <laughs> store and not buying everything that fills up the bag right. uh, and that's the same idea on budgeting uh, if we don't we're going to have trouble and it's easier to hold the line than it is to take it back the same thing on employee contracts uh, a lot of people are talking about take backs already and I can understand the desire to do that, and there may be some need to do that, but I'll tell you, it's a lot harder to take something back than it is to simply hold the line for five years. And so if we, we pass Measure B and we get an extra millions or millions of dollars every year, 8.9 million, I think is the projected amount, what are we going to do? Are we going to start raising our salaries? Are we going to start paying more into our retirement plans? Are we going to start paying more into the medical plans? Are we going to start hiring $400,000 city managers and $200,000 department heads and $180,000 firefighters and $150,000 firefighters? I mean, those are job, tough jobs. I've, I've, I've been in firefights. I've shot at people and I've been shot back at. I know what that's like, it's, and it's a tough job but we can have to bring in more people to do that that don't necessarily have to be the ones with the badge and the gun. And that requires a different mindset. You saw that for the first time with, with the chief the other night. Right. And that was a real eye-opener for me. Uh, but it has to be done. But it requires So using non-sworn personnel, for example, in the police department to, to carry out a lot of tasks? Yes, and, like and non-sworn doesn't necessarily mean volunteers, although that can be an added advantage. My neighbor's a volunteer now that he's retired, and that, that can help. My other neighbor used to hand out all the parking tickets all the time in town. And he actually made a lot of money for the city when he was doing that. But you have people who are trained in scientific methods more than anything else. When I was a deputy district attorney, when I was a law clerk for the U.S. Court of Appeals, I reviewed thousands and thousands of criminal convictions. And you have to have good police work at the scene. 
which means people who can collect evidence, people who can collect reports the right way, people who can do accident investigations. You don't have to have somebody who's trained to use a weapon and arrest people do those activities. They can so, be done by other people. So like non-sworn investigators or something like that? that exactly. That yes. We wouldn't have to mm -hmm. uh, pay and, and it wouldn't have... They could be subcontractors basically. Potentially, is that, is that what well, you're Well, if you wanted to outsource, and that's a whole different mm -hmm. area, uh, that requires negotiations with your employee groups. Right. You can't force it down their throat. No. And I wouldn't want to, and that wouldn't be right. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was an example. Uh, when I arrived at my infantry unit in Vietnam, they were out in the field, and they put me to work in the, in, in the office because I could type. <laughs> and about a day later, the unit got back, and the captain walks in and says, who's the new guy? You know, blah, 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 he's infantry. He says, Tell him he's saddling up, he's going out tomorrow, he's not staying here in the office, somebody else can do that job. <laughs> so I had a skill, a, a training, a specific ability to do something. And that's true with a sworn personnel who has a badge and can arrest people. I have a nephew who's a police officer, <clears throat> and he was, he's a corporal, doesn't live in this state, lives in a very high earning state. He called me up when all this hit the, the news, he said, are you guys crazy out there? You guys pay your corporals more than we pay our highest ranking officer in this whole state. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, well, we, we do have some of the highest paid, uh, uh, both police and fire, I think almost anywhere, really, in Vallejo. Yes, and to change that requires political will. And that requires free-thinking people who are going to be honest enough with the numbers and not motivate towards somebody who gets them into office or to whom they think they owe their loyalty. Right. And I definitely am an independent person. Right. Have been. And, and... <clears throat> In, in terms of the influence of, of special interests, mm -hmm. um, who, who are your backers and, and endorsements, things like that, Robert? Individuals at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been endorsed by the Democratic Central Committee and the South Democratic Club. Other than that, nobody. And all of my fundraisers, and I've been doing a lot of them, have been by individuals. Um, I've had a few $500 donations. Most of them are in the $10, $20, $50 range. Uh, that's who believes in me. And I think they believe in me because they have come to know me and how I think. Um, the work I did on the Planning Commission, the work I did on the Charter Review, <clears throat> the ability to articulate things. Uh, we're getting some good results at the forums that we have, but most people don't see these forums. They can't come. And as people come to really look at what is needed on a city council, the attributes that I can bring to the table, and my skills and my background and my experiences and my knowledge, I think are something that is sorely needed uh, on any city council, but especially in Vallejo at this time. Right. right. Now, <coughs> l let's just let's just bounce back to uh, uh, another item that's going to be on the ballot, mm -hmm. which is Measure C, mm -hmm. uh, medical marijuana. Correct. Uh, that that's an issue because we've got <coughs> over twenty medical marijuana dispensaries in Vallejo at this point. It's a bit of a green rush. And counting. And <laughs> counting. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts about? Measure C, do you favor it, and your thoughts about medical marijuana dispensaries going forward, and also the conflict, conflict between the federal and state regulations on that? Again, that's an awful lot. And where I have a skill that most people don't is that in the federal bankruptcy laws, which are practiced in the federal court, it's a national level, it also takes into consideration what goes on in the state courts. So this is why you saw the question of can we void out these employee contracts, that was an inter interplay between federal and state law. And we get this in bankruptcy all the time. It's the same thing on the medical marijuana problem. We have federal law that says it's a class one drug, you can't have it at all. We have a state initiative that says you can use it for medical purposes. Uh, but all you need is a recommendation of a doctor, it's not even a prescription, it's not even a, a, a you really need this thing. And that needs to be addressed at the state level. That's one thing. We've got to go to our state legislators, I think, and, and modernize or tweak that law to start with. I'm going to vote yes uh, on Measure C. I'm going to tax them. I mean, they're here. We're not going to be able to throw, throw them out on the street. They're already here. And yes, they should be paying taxes, and they should be paying high taxes. Do you think there should be a moratorium? I do, because otherwise we'll just have more people move in. And you can say, oh, they're illegal uh, all you want. It's not stopping them from coming in. And of course, there, are the, there is the question of whether or not they have a business license. A business license is simply 
a revenue producing process for the city. It doesn't mean you're a proper business. It means you got to pay money. That's all it does. That's all it does. You also have to have a, a, an ability to conduct business in the area. And what we're trying to say is, oh, you violate our zoning laws. Our problem is our zoning laws are, are outdated. They need to be updated with the general plan. And they don't say you can or you cannot have a medical marijuana dispensary. So people come in and they open up and they use the pretext of say, you know, selling cookies or, or, or dolls or whatever else it is that they, they use, and they, 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 they open up. So we are going to have to have a moratorium for a while. The city of San Jose recently addressed this issue at their first reading of their ordinance. They decided to have 10 dispensaries, I think, in the city and charge them uh, $10,000 apiece for their licensing fee. Uh, my idea is the city is pretty amenable in Vallejo to four zones, north, south, east, west. And we maybe have one dispensary in each zone. And we have a selection process by which the best and most qualified medical dispensary would qualify for that. Because a lot of them, let's face it, are, are nothing more than pretexts. And then they right. regulate, and they pay, and they pay, and they pay, because we can justify a fee as long as it's not a tax. Where it stays as a fee is if you're paying for services that are rendered on behalf of that particular industry. That means auditing, that means zoning, that means policing, that means narcotics uh, rehabilitation. I think you're going to have to demand that they offer a narcotics anonymous classes, not at their facility. And, you know, they can charge for that, but the, the dispensary should pay for it, not offer it. They have to provide it through an outside nonprofit, whether it's a church or an established nonprofit organization that can and should be done because you've got to address the need. Uh, I saw medics in Vietnam carry, carry marijuana for the Viet Cong, and it was very effective as a pain suppressant. They didn't have a lot of drugs, but what they did use it for was very effective. And I also, unfortunately, one night saw a truck driver who had never been in combat or in a firefight in his life get some grass and get stoned. He pulled the pin and then he released the handle before we could get to him. So it can be a destructive drug as well. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, and of course it does bring out a lot of depression. No hand people. grenades at the marijuana dispensaries. <laughs> Nor anywhere else. <laughs> no. <laughs> so so it, it's something that is not going to go away. We are going to have to address it in a responsible, intelligent manner. It can be something that a lot of money is made off of it because we, we, it can serve as a revenue generating process. It won't be as much as the general tax uh, measure, that's true, but it can also serve as a dedicated source of funding for something like the police department because they're the ones that are so worried we're going to have all this crime. Uh, but it can be used as a dedicated source of funding if we need to. And that's something we have to be open-minded about and not shut down just because it's well, That's an interesting scenario because then the mm -hmm. police would be encouraging people to smoke up. No, they wouldn't be encouraging them to smoke up. <laughs> I'm uh, joking. Uh, <laughs> I'm just making a little joke, Robert. And in all honesty, there are probably some that do. <laughs> <laughs> but on a, on a more serious note, um, as we're getting close to the end of our time, mm -hmm. what what do you see as as your vision for Vallejo going forward, and mm -hmm. what are the most important issues that need to be addressed in the upcoming council? Well, as I said, there are four areas that I want to see development. One, of course, is in business enhancement, and that's where we have the small businesses, the festivals, the more user-friendly attitude on the part of City Hall, and I can cite you example after example right. of people who have had difficulties. But we work more uh, closely with the school, uh, school administration. We have a wonderful new superintendent who's from the same yeah, school that I We haven't touched on, on, on that, so tell me a little bit uh, as far as what you see uh, your role would be if you're on city council relating to the schools? Well, I started talking about this in January and I'm very pleased to see a lot of other people picking it up finally. And what I believe is there has to be more cooperation and more openness between the two government bodies. In some cities, back east in particular, the city council and the school board are one and the same. So when they come to California, they're surprised to find out that city councils don't have that much authority over it. But one of the things we can do is start having a full-time liaison officer. When I was on planning commission, we had a full-time liaison person. And they, they were there, or they were supposed to be there, and they advised us and kept us in contact with the city council. We don't have that with the education. We have a 
an intergovernmental agency that fortunately is supposed to meet once every quarter and often doesn't have very good attendance. So let's have a designated liaison officer from a city council to the public department of education, the school board, and the superintendent of instruction. Let's start working closer together. When they closed uh, Springstown, they wanted to have a march from there down to where Vallejo Junior High was. So they went to the police department to get a permit, parade permit, and the police department said $1,500, please, just to walk so they could cut and shut down the intersections, which could be done by volunteer people as well. And that type of mentality has to change, but that means reception, a reception on the part of city council. I had school, member, school board members, teachers, and students tell me all the problems with city council not being receptive to, the government being resistant to, the, uh, the education. Let's face it, our property values are driven by educational systems. You want to improve your property values, improve the Department of Education in our, in our city, start working with it. Bring in uh, advisors. And this, the superintendent we have comes from University Pacific, which has some of the most innovative and creative thinking techniques and teaching techniques of any educational system in the entire country. They're very creative, and she's illustrating that already. And that's what McGeorge at the law school does. That's what they do in the uh, educational department in Stockton. They, they think outside the box. And I think you're seeing the benefits of that already. So we need to keep that momentum going. It's critical that people on city council be very education friendly. Otherwise, we won't improve our school systems. Believe me, we won't. Um, we also, I think, in, in the terms of education, can start becoming uh, monitors. Uh, I've touched on the need and the desire to have neighborhood associations, which is where they can band together and advise the government itself. Well, they can also adopt a, the local school in that area. Right now, uh, you have to go through the PTA to be involved. You can't just walk into the principal's office and say, uh, blah, 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 you get thrown out usually. Um, by having a neighborhood association there, there's somebody who's recognized that the school can meet with and the neighborhood can meet with when they have a problem at a local school. Whether it's people at the high school campus spinning donuts on, uh, in your intersection or breaking your windows somewhere or graffitiizing your fence, which, you know, I live near a school, I get it every once in a while, we just paint it over again. But there's no dialogue right now. By, ha by having neighborhood associations talk with education, we can open up that dialogue. We, we have to have more citizenry involvement in this whole in this whole town, otherwise we won't make it. We can't just say, city council, you figure out who, who you're going to vote, and we got four people, I'm happy, goodbye. That, just, that can't, can't keep going anymore. More involvement, more communication. That's a big thing, yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, I, I, I guess it, what I ask at this point, Robert, is, is there anything that you think of that you, a question you wish I had asked that I haven't that, that comes to your mind? Well, I, th I think the experience um, background, and, and I feel like I've been oriented towards this position for a long time. As I said, I started out in it. Um, I've lobbied in Washington on behalf of consumers. I'm used to legislators. I speak bureaucrat, I speak legalese, I speak bankruptcy, uh, I speak common English still. <laughs> and more than anything else, I listen. Uh, I do have ringing in my ears from small arms fire, and that means that I have to listen better than most people. I have to really concentrate on it. And by having that defect, it's actually enhanced my ability to listen to people very carefully in a controlled environment. Now, I'm no good in a party room, which is why people think I'm boring and not much fun and a great social person, because I can't really hear them sometimes in a cocktail party. <laughs> but in the refined air of a council chamber or a legislative session or the courtroom, where sound is really well controlled, I have learned techniques to listen very carefully. And I've learned how to concentrate on what is being said rather than who says it or whom they say it on behalf of. So that's one of the real attributes I think I can bring to it. Plus I've been trained as a mediator, arbitrator, I'm a litigator, I've probably done everything that you can conceivably think of where government and the interrelationship of government <coughs> with citizenry is involved. I understand the mechanics of government. This is a job I can do, I know. And for too many years I've sat out in the audience like the rest of us have and listened to people talk about how they're going to bring us the sun, the moon, the stars above. And I realize it's now time for me to step up to the plate and put myself where my mouth is. Okay. 
Would you like to give a final word to the voters, Robert? Okay. Well, I am running on November 8th. This is the first time I've ever run for anything. I believe that with my attributes, I can bring to the table things that aren't there. We are going to have to negotiate the employee contracts, and I've negotiated contracts in the past. I've hired and I've fired people. I've worked with the personnel board, knowing how to budget, how to pay people, and I, I've been involved, I've fought fires with the U.S. Forest Service, I've been in firefights with the United States Army. I understand those jobs. I've worked with Public Works, uh, spent a year with them actually when my mother went to Alaska. So I understand how Public Works work as well. I can bring all this experience to the table, but only if I'm elected. There are three positions open on the City Council, plus the Mayor, and I am, I am asking that you at least consider me and vote for me for one of those city council positions. So I think we can make this a much better city than it's ever been before, and I'm prepared to do the work. Mark, thank you very much. Robert, I appreciate the thank opportunity so to speak with you as always. It's always been a pleasure. It's a pleasure sitting with you. My pleasure. Thank you.